Well, working through this old plane has been kind of like, uh, it's kind of like been a time capsule. And it's really kind of fun to look back at the parts that are in this plane and the things I'm changing out and upgrading and all that kind of stuff. And it's a lot due to the way we've had great technological advances in this hobby. And I mean, I think we've come to a point where we're actually kind of taking some of this stuff for granted to be able to look back and say, why did I do things like that in this airplane and say, well, it's because that was the best technology we had at the time and that's how we did things. So this has been kind of fun. So uh, let's take a little bit of time and go through this and I'll share what I've been finding with you. And eh, we'll talk about a little bit about in the day, back in the day, you know, that kind of stuff. So here we go. Hey, welcome back to the shop. It's really good to see you here again. Yeah, I'm kind of a old curmudgeon in this hobby, I guess. I've been around for oh, about 33, 34 years, I think I've been flying. Um, and so back when I built this, I think I was about 10 years into the hobby at the most. This was gonna be my first giant scale aircraft. And so that was like, uh, oh, right around 2000, somewhere around there, 1990s, late 1990s to 2000, I started working on this plane and I think I finished it somewhere around 2001 or two. And uh, yeah, so it was a lot of, um, it, it, back then I didn't have a whole lot of time I was working and uh, what little time I had, I would get on this plane and try to work with it. I think it ultimately took me about five years to build this plane uh, due to different things, my career, uh, moving, all that kind of stuff. It, it, things were just busy. And so I didn't have a whole lot of time for the hobby back then. So I took what time I could to build this plane. And um, yeah, so anyways, it's been like, like I was saying, it's kind of like been a time capsule to do this because um, all of the parts of it and everything, they're all back from that time. And I had a problem earlier this week where I had to change out the servos that were in the wing of this plane. Let me go grab one here. And I'm gonna be saying this a lot probably. I'm gonna probably be saying back in the day, this was what we had. So let me show you this one here. This is a Futaba 148, S148 servo. This was the standard back in the day. Um, and we would use this because it had, a, I think it had a pretty good output. I believe it was like 32 ounces of output, which is good. I mean, for the surfaces and everything that we're driving, uh, it was fine. It worked great. It's an analog servo and, um, it, you know, it was a $15 servo. So <laughs> me being kind of cheap, um, yeah, I used a lot of these things, but if you had them, you know, if, if as long as you didn't over, overbook it, meaning, you know, using a surface too big for what it could actually output. It was a good servo. So anyways, the problem we have with them now, let's see, back in, back in the day, uh, we used four cell NICAD batteries as a standard. So that was 4.8 volts and it was perfect. It worked fine. Um, as the battery chemistries have gotten better over the years, you know, we've got longer flight times uh, available to us now because um, we're getting these batteries that are not only better because they had uh, a longer output time, which, you know, that's here or there. Cause I mean, usually I would fly a plane for maybe like 10 minutes. And so you don't need a battery that can go 45 minutes if you're only going to fly a couple of 10 minute flights. Right. But the chemistries became better. The problem we have with NICADs are over time, the way we would use them, uh, unless you cycled them down every time you flew the plane and then brought them back up just before you used it again, the battery would age and develop a memory. And pretty soon we're throwing out these NICAD packs and it was, it was kind of a pain in the butt to have to replace them as often as we did. Uh, the other thing about the newer batteries is they're a little bit lighter. The lithium typed batteries are a little bit lighter. And so my desire is to put a lithium LIFE battery, that's a lithium ferric uh, battery into this to power it. So I went ahead and, and stuck one in here. It's, a, it's called, also called an A123 battery. So I've got it in here 
and I hooked it into the new system, uh, put a new receiver into this, and we'll go over the receiver in a minute. But um, the, the part is in here now, uh, and so I was testing everything, and I found a problem that existed, and it has to do with these servos. Back in the day, these servos could handle 4.8 volts, no problem. It could even, as the pack was, um, you know, used straight off of the charger, it could handle that 5.2, 5.3, however, 5.4 volts somewhere, no problem. But uh, when we went to these newer batteries, the lithium ferric, that's a 6. Point, I believe it's a 6.3 is the minimum it's going to be. And as it's charged up, it's going to be closer to 7.2 volts, which is too much voltage for these. So it developed a problem that I remember I used to see at some point uh, in our airplanes, you know, using that same equipment, we evolved into using five, uh, five packs of the NICADs, and that would get you six volts. And when those were running hot, they'd be around six and a half volts or so. And the thing that I noticed when it would get to about six and a half volts is right after we took it off the charger and put it into the plane or, or whatever, um, the servos would kind of bounce. And that's the exact problem I was seeing with this one. And I recognize it right away. They would kind of bounce for a while, but after you did it, you know, left the radio on for a little bit, it would get that voltage back into a range where the servos didn't have that excess hunting from bouncing. And so that's the problem I had. I put in this new pack and I noticed that the uh, servos, well, here, I'll show you a little clip of what, what I'm talking about here. Uh, it's just simply, there's too much voltage and the pots are kind of hunting to find the, to recenter the servo after you engage it. And, and that's what that is. So these had to go, had to put in some uh, servos that could handle it. And the ones I replaced them with were the, uh, it's a, a high tech, I think it is called the 545BB and it's um, high speed HS 545BB. I put those in there. Also not a super new servo, but it can handle the voltage. This doesn't need to have high performance digital servos in it. Um, this is not a 3D airplane. This is gonna be a nice slow cruiser. I'm gonna really enjoy flying this plane and it really doesn't need it. It can have an analog servo and that's what I'm gonna run with this one. This is a Futaba 72 megahertz radio. Uh, this is an FM radio, which was a big deal back in the day because the FM radios was what the whole system was going over to. Previous radios in, in RC, so we're talking about uh, previous to 1990 and back, were mostly AM radios. And AM and FM, that's just like the stations that are on your uh, radio in your car. Uh, this was uh, putting out a signal that was much cleaner than an AM. So like when you're in your car and you're listening to something on AM radio, a lot of talk stations are now on AM because the quality of the voice type transmission doesn't need to be that great. It's, it's more crucial if you're playing music or something like that because the signal is much cleaner, much quieter, has better noise suppression and all that kind of stuff. And so same thing in our airplane radios, although you don't get to hear it, uh, the AM radios had less of a chance of having noise interference, or excuse me, the AM radios had more of a chance of noise interference and the FMs had less of a chance. So everything at that point, uh, 90s and up, was starting to go to FM. That was the big deal. And this is a single channel. This was channel number 24. And uh, there was several of these channels. This was just after narrow banding happened. That's another long story too. But this was, uh, it opened up a whole bunch of different channels for us in the United States to fly our planes on. Um, and that was a big deal. That was a really big deal because prior to it, with the wider band, uh, it, the, the signal was actually and trapping several different channel possibilities into one signal. So that meant less guys could fly at the same time, or you had to have the worry that if your channel was one channel and there was another one nearby, you might overlap and, and you know interfere with the other guy's airplane. So this made it so that we could fly more of our planes at the same time. Pretty cool stuff. So um, look at the size of this. And now let me show you the size of the radio that I'm gonna be putting into this one. And there's a clip here for that. 
And then um, take a look at it. You can see the difference. Now this was seven channels and the other one is a six channel. Now I actually only need five channels to run this plane. So a six channel is more appropriate, but look at how much smaller it is. I mean, it's almost like the connectors are a big part of going into these things, the connectors for the servos. And uh, the technology has changed so much in that period of time. So whereas, oh, and this too, look at this one's got this. Now, if you could see this, this is a uh, 33 inch antenna. I think that was the standard for Futaba. And the way you'd have to do it is you would have to put it in here in a way that you could, I routed it down along the bottom of the airplane back here. So it stuck out way back here and you had to make it so that this antenna was fully spread out. And so a lot of planes you'll see from back in the day have the antenna hooked to like the top of the fin or something like that because it makes it so that it's got better, you know, better range out there. You also had to be careful that you didn't have like uh, uh, push rods that were interfering with this thing in the plane. That would wreck your, uh, wreck your, uh, what do you want to call it? The strength of your signal and the capability of this antenna if you had that going on. So that was an issue having those. Now we got these radios like this guy here that have, let's see if I can get that in a shot. You got like these uh, two whiskers right here and that could be mounted anywhere inside there, no problem. And it'll work just fine. So it could be inside the plane mounted to the sidewall. The thing they look for is uh, making sure that the antennas kind of, you want to have like one going this way, this way, and another one going this way, this way. I don't know if you could see that. This way, this way, and this way, this way. It's a big thing, it's, it's part of the diversity, hoping that it's going to uh, increase the range of your plane, no matter what uh, position it is in the sky. And so that's what's in there. Now you also see, this is, a, this is an eight channel. Now the one I showed you was a six channel. This one here is an eight channel, but still pretty darn small in comparison. So what has changed with these is this. Let's go ahead and pull this baby apart. The boards inside here are much bigger than they uh, back in the past than they are nowadays. And there has been, let me see if I can get that so that you could see it with this camera here. These are two boards and they're stacked, but in between them, you can see these things here uh, down in there. Those are capacitors and diodes and resistors and everything. And this was the way they used to do stuff. It, everything was mounted on these motherboard cards and welded in there somehow, um, soldered on. And they were great, except for having components that are mounted like that on the board, make them susceptible to vibration. And these planes have a lot of vibration in them. So anytime we were putting these inside the plane, you had to wrap them in foam and you had to try to isolate them as much as you could from any kind of vibration because these parts on the radio boards would come off. I mean, they would get vibrated and break and then the radio quit. And then I remember every time you crashed a plane, you were supposed to send these things back into uh, Futaba for them to check it out to make sure it was okay. And that was, uh, that was something else he had to do. So you didn't really didn't want to crash because then you'd have to have your radio sent in and make sure it's okay. And it's, it's a very unsatisfying purchase just to make sure it's okay, but it's a peace of mind thing you really had to do. So anyways, that's where those are. Let me show you this too. This is how it determined what channel you were on. This is the crystal. So this one here is channel number 24 which was what the channel I used to like to have. Uh, crystals are very fragile. What would happen if you got in a wreck was you would have to send in a radio, like I said, and this was one of the parts they would check because these could crack. And if they would crack internally, you couldn't tell by looking at it. You really can't, you know, you can't tell if there's any damage to it, but um, it would be a matter of, you could not fly the plane without testing it. Uh, because it could be, it could with that crack in there, it would make an intermittent short. So in other words, the radio would be working fine. Vibration would start and it might separate the crack that's in that crystal enough to make it stop receiving. And once it stopped receiving, into the ground. So that was one of those kind of things that you, you really had to be careful of. 
Uh, remember, every time you wanted to change a channel on your thing, if you wanted to change out the crystal and go to a different one, you had to have your radio retuned to that. So they said, I, I don't really know, but that's what they told us we had to do. And so he did it and you were happy about it. But anyway, um, yeah, so here we are with the, uh, this is the uh, 72 megahertz radio and we have advanced way beyond it. Like I said, down, down the road somewhere, I think I'm gonna do something that kind of talks about how this radio technology has changed because back in the day, when you got to the field, um, you couldn't turn your transmitter on unless you called out to everybody and asked them, hey, anybody else on channel 24? Because I'm about to turn it on. And if somebody said, no, oh, I'm on it, don't do it, you know, they could be up in the air flying because if you turn on your radio with this channel and somebody else had it up in the air, boom, that would go in. It would lock up their, their uh, box and suddenly they couldn't fly anymore. So this was a big deal. Um, you had to make sure that there was constant communication. And I used to go to these giant meets and it was like, uh, you know, there'd be people, there'd be like hundreds of people there flying and they had to have compounds, you know, impounds where they would uh, take radios away from guys while they had their planes there to make sure that they would not accidentally shoot somebody down. Like there would be like five planes up at a time and they had to make sure that nobody would be turning them on back in the pits there working on their plane or something like that and shoot down who's flying through the air. It was a very confusing time, but you know, it was the best we had back in those days. And you had to have good communication in the pits. You had to make sure that you weren't gonna turn on your radio because the underlying thing was, if you shot somebody down and you know, you fessed up to it or you admitted it or whatever, then you owed that person a new plane, plus all the damage that happened to theirs, you know? So if it meant the engine got crushed, if it meant the radio system, the entire plane, you owed them that. So that was the, that was kind of like the gentleman's agreement about this kind of signal technology. Nowadays with 2.4, we don't even worry about it. You know, you can turn it on anytime you want and it's not gonna interfere with the other planes around you, which is pretty darn amazing. And we forget about that kind of stuff. It's one of those things, like I said, we take it for granted. So anyways, that's it for the radio. Um, I will follow up on more of that stuff. It's been a great time talking with you again, and uh, I'm having a great time running the time capsule here. Next step is gonna be uh, next week, we're supposed to have a couple of nice days. Mark and I are gonna get together, and he's got an engine he needs to run on a new plane, and I'm gonna put a prop on this one here and go through this one to see if this engine will start up and run again. I've already ordered a uh, complete carburetor rebuild kit for it, just in case. I have a feeling the diaphragm is gonna be ixne de udine, so, we'll probably need to take that out and rebuild it. Um, not a big deal, but um, anyways, that's next up uh, for the testing and updating of this guy. See you next time. Thanks for stopping in. And uh, you know, if you got some friends that uh, are interested in RC models, tell them to come check us out. You know, I try to introduce people as best I can, especially newbies. But you know, even if you're a guy who's been around, I love talking with people about airplanes. You know that. And so, you know, put a comment down below if you got questions about this. Be happy to talk to you. The trick is I've got to be able to see your comment. Sometimes they show up in different places. I get emails about them sometimes. And those are really easy because I read my emails every day. But sometimes they kind of end up in a back burner on my studio feed. And I got to go back and read through that. And there's some that don't get to my email. So I will do my best to answer any questions I can um, about, the, uh, about what we're doing on the channel here. So... Hey, have a great day and uh, get building.